Realm Presents The Triangle, Episode 8. For the first time in a long while, Michael Hammond felt a sense of purpose. From the moment Sagara had rapped on his apartment door, everything had surely led to this. He'd had an inkling of it when he'd first found the tapes and recognized what they were. But with no ability to play them, both he and the tapes were useless. The leather case sitting on the cave floor in front of him changed all of that. A B and H reporter. He'd only seen one in a museum, and even then it was old and worn. This one looked brand new. The leather case had protected it reasonably well, both in the musty lab and at the Althouse's sandy encampment. He should have figured they'd have scavenged the most valuable piece of electronic equipment on the island. He unfastened the latches and made himself pause. He should be careful. He was still breathing hard from the exertion of running the thing up here. If he broke it now out of eagerness, he'd never forgive himself. It was probably their only way to listen to whatever was on the audio reels. A shadow passed across the mouth of the cave. What's in the box? Miller asked. She wasn't even breathing hard. A piece of history. And if we're lucky, it's still working, Hammond said. The yacht people had it? Yeah, I just assumed the Russians took it. Soviets, she said. He glanced up at her, not sure how to take the correction. Her face was emotionless. Right. Soviets. There was an awkward pause, so he looked back at the recorder case. They're not as bad as all of you think, Miller said. I'll take your word for it. He held his breath and lifted the leather cover. Thank God. Hello, gorgeous. It was all there. The microphone, the recording heads, amplifier, everything. The control switch on the front had only three settings. Off, playback, and record. Both of the recorder's spindles were empty, so he rummaged through his pile of possessions and found one of the reels he'd salvaged from the lab. It fit on the playback spindle perfectly. I suppose it's no accident you have a tape for this, Miller said. We found a bunch in the lab. This has to be what recorded them. Why would they use such outdated technology? Hey, this is a beautiful piece of equipment. Gave birth to an industry, you know. She raised up her hands as if to say, Sorry I offended you. I don't think it was outdated for them, anyway. He wound the leading edge of the tape through the heads and looped it around the pickup reel. Then he turned the control dial to playback. Nothing happened. Damn. You forgot to plug it in, Hammond, Miller said. He shook his head. It runs on batteries. That was one of the big selling points. If he remembered correctly, the battery compartment would be on the left side. He found the release on the bottom and pulled off the cover. Two metal objects tumbled out. He recognized the round, flat one. It was a manual tape winder. Not essential, but nice to have. He stuck it on top of the reel from the lab, just in case he needed to rewind it. The other piece was thin and angular, with a hexagonal bit at one end and a spinning piece at the other. Yes, I was hoping this would be here. What is that, a window crank? He laughed. Why would a 75-year-old radio need a window crank? She shrugged and looked away. She'd stationed herself at the mouth of the cave, not quite blocking the light, but where she'd have a good vantage point for anyone approaching from below. Old habits must die hard. You're not far off, though. Most of these old recorders are wind up, and this is the crank handle. He found the keyhole in the front of the box. Well, keyhole was a misnomer. It was a hex-shaped port, and sure enough, the bit end of the crank slid right into it. He rotated it, gently at first, until he could feel the slight resistance that meant the gears inside were turning. If you wind it up, why did it come with batteries? Miller asked. The battery is just for the amplifier. The reels are turned by a clockwork motor. A 
Garrard, I think. Any chance it'll still work after so long? We'll see, he muttered because he was counting revolutions. After ten, he stomped and moved the switch to playback. The reels quivered, but didn't move. The metallic grating sound from beneath made him cringe. Shit, I think I broke it. Maybe it just needs a push, Miller said. It probably wouldn't help anything, but he had the winder on his reel anyway. He gave it a little push in the clockwise direction. Like magic. Both reels started to turn. Yes! Miller smiled. See? I told you. Her smile threw him. She didn't seem like the cheerful type. That head injury really screwed her up. But he found himself smiling back anyway. How did you know? Old machines always get jammed up around seawater. Half of our problems we solve with a healthy dose of gear lubricant. What about the other half? Her hand straight to her hip, and she frowned when she found it empty. You don't want to know. Do you mind getting the others while I set up my audio rig? They'll want to hear this. I'll tell the captain first. He was so eager to wind the recorder again that he almost missed it. Captain? He cleared his throat. Uh, the, the vice admiral, you mean? That's what I just said. Right. Sorry. He didn't want to look at her, so he made himself busy collecting the rest of the reels from his jacket pockets. He'd made it out with thirteen. An unlucky number, but he hadn't found the courage to sneak back into the city at low tide to liberate more of them. He glanced up, but Miller was gone again. Damn, she could be quiet when she wanted to. He got the reels stacked in three neat piles. Maybe the baker's dozen would be enough? Then again, they might all be empty. Wouldn't that be perfect, to have Miller summon everyone here only to hear a bunch of static? He probably should have tested it first. As it was, he'd barely have time to get his rig set up before everyone got here. And something told him he should do that. Technically, he could wire his power supply to the speaker on the side of the reporter, but the speaker itself might be shunned after sitting on the sand at the outhouse camp for God knew how long. If there was audio to be heard, it deserved the best playback he could give it. This would either be a moment of triumph or an abject failure. He might as well swing for the fences. David Sagara could no longer put a spin on it. This mission was officially a failure. They were no closer to finding USS Wasp than they'd been at the start of the goddamn investigation. Now, they were marooned, with no way to contact the outside world and no viable means of escape. This went beyond failure. This was a complete disaster. Better vice admirals than he had been stripped of their commands for less. It was his fault, too. He knew better than to trust McBride. When he'd first learned about the set of coordinates, his instinct had been to call it in, follow procedure, wait for the tropical storm to pass so that they could come here in force. But the moment that smuggler had said the words, Navy ship, he let his personal feelings for the crew of the Wasp get in the way. Now the motor lifeboat was wrecked, Johnson was dead, and the rest of them weren't much better off. Sir! Miller jogged toward him from down the beach. She was recovering quickly to be able to move that well after being practically moribund on the submarine. Maybe the Soviets had been keeping her sedated. He wouldn't put it past them. Now she appeared healthy enough, though something about her manner had changed. He couldn't quite put his finger on it. What is it, Miller? He asked. It came out more gruffly than he'd intended, but he refused to apologize. Hammond thinks he can play the audio tapes. What tapes? She put her fingers together in the shape of a circle, maybe four or five inches across. Middle spools like these, sir. He says he found them in a lab somewhere in the city. Come to think of it, Hammond had mentioned something about old audio reels. Sagara had tuned him out after a few minutes. He grunted. 
Can't imagine they'll tell us anything. If those old notebooks were any indication, the audio reels held nothing of interest. They were too old to have any information about the wasp. I'll still give them a listen, sir, if that's all right. We might learn something useful about this place. He bit his lips against a sigh. Miller was right. They should listen when the audio reels were played. And, like a good sailor, she reminded him of his duty without saying so directly. Guess I should, too. Where is he? Up in the cave, sir. He was worried about the EMF interference. Well, at least Hammond had found something other than Olivia to obsess over. Sigara made his way toward the cave while Miller ran off to get the others. She must have hustled double time, because she caught up to him even before he'd reached the cave entrance. How's the head feeling? he said. Better, sir. Feels like the cobwebs are lifting. Even so, I don't want you to push it too hard. A head injury is a serious thing. He'd seen it before. A young sailor eager to come back to full duty after an injury and not taking the time to heal. Understood, sir. They entered the cave, and the smell of wet stone brought a flash memory of the first night they'd taken shelter here. He'd known they should set a watch and take turns, but he'd been so exhausted. Then Miller had wandered off, and everything sort of spiraled after that. He never fully took command of the situation. If he couldn't control his own people, he had little chance of standing up to Dimitri and his men. Hammond knelt against the far wall, fastening some wires from his audio rig into what looked to be a leather suitcase. What have you got there, Hammond? Sigara asked. It's an early magnetic audio recorder. We found it at the Althaus camp. I'm sure this is what the researchers used to make their recordings. Have you listened to any yet? Hammond shook his head. I was waiting for all of you. St. Clair and Dumont arrived together, both of them jumpy with excitement. You can proceed, Hammond, Sigara said. Shouldn't we wait for McBride? He'll want to hear this. The Vice Admiral ground his teeth. McBride can take a long... A long what? McBride called, striding up to the cave like a man arriving at a cocktail party. I can think of a few ways I'd like that sentence to end. It was tempting to finish his thought, but why give McBride the satisfaction? Cigar clamped his mouth shut. He looked at Hammond. Play it. All right. Here goes nothing. Hammond positioned the speakers on his audio rig, which he'd wired into what appeared to be an antique tape player. Which tape is this? Cigar asked. The earliest date I have, it's labeled April 1949. Hammond turned a switch in the front of the player. Nothing happened. Hell, it's broken? McBride groused. Talk about a letdown. Oh, ye of little faith. Hammond pushed one of the reels forward with his finger. They lurched into motion, unsteadily at first, but then falling into a rhythm. Even better. The speakers began to buzz with a static noise, almost like the sound of putting the needle to an old record. It was strange to hear an electronic sound that was modern and old at once. Then there was a soft click, and a woman's voice filled the cave. Testing, one, two, three. This is Dr. Chloe Brown. Journal entry one, testing. There was a period of mostly static for several seconds. Sigara moved closer. Something about the woman's voice drew him. Even on the old tapes, she sounded so real. Well, this seems to be working. I'm Dr. Chloe Brown, senior scientist at the Atlantis Project. McBride gasped softly. Please tell me she just said Atlantis. She did, Sigara snapped. Now put down. The date is April 2nd, 1949, which means I've been here, golly, almost four years. I'm recording this on a machine that we got from the Brits. They called it a portable tape recorder. I'm not supposed to be doing this, but the director's men found my journal last week and confiscated it on the grounds of security. Can you believe that? As if living in our island bubble isn't enough. 
I filed a written protest with his secretary for all the good it will do me. Until they give it back, I'll just have to get by with this. Hammond stopped the playback without being asked to. He turned with a sheepish look on his face. It sounds like this is just someone's diary. So it would seem, McBride said dryly. Why would she go to the trouble of recording this? St. Clair asked. Hammond shrugged. Maybe she was lonely. How many tapes are there? Sagara asked. Thirteen? It could be a coincidence. It probably was a coincidence. But Sagara had heard the name Project Atlantis once before. Only one way to know for sure. Let's hear a different tape. All right. It took him a minute to wind the tape back up onto its reel and swap it out for another one. This one is from February 1950. This is Dr. Chloe Brown. It's February 14th, 1950. Valentine's Day, if you're into that sort of thing. No one here has time to celebrate because we're six days into an intensive meteorological adjustment run. The conditions are clear, just like always. 78 degrees Fahrenheit with a light breeze out of the southwest. We initiated a test run at 0800, but cut the duration back to three hours to see if that mitigates some of the side effects. As a result, our peak output barely reached four meters per second. What do you think she's referring to? St. Clair asked. That's a velocity measurement, Dumont said. Got to be the hydrofan. Sagara muttered a curse. He'd missed something on the audio. Can you go back? Not without rewinding the whole reel, Hammond said quickly. Hell. Turn it up, then. Hammond complied, and the woman's voice got louder. And we won't know for another day or two if it worked. It's hard to study the nature of the effect without putting ourselves at risk. None of the animals will go near it. Some of the team members objected to continuing the experiments after we lost the research vessel. That was before we knew the dangers of the hydrofan. The Atlantis project began before the war ended, when a marine meteorological weapon might have made a real difference. Now that we're at peace, it's hard to justify such hazardous work in the name of patriotism. We lost three people on that boat. We couldn't hold a funeral. All that remained was rust and dust. We can't even notify their families. The electromagnetic interference from the hydrofan lingers for hours, and the director refuses to alter our schedule. They call it a hydrofan too, Hammond whispered. How cool is that? The recording went on to detail the experiments and weather conditions, interspersed with the occasional complaint about the project director. Sagara hardly listened. A ball of ice started to form in his gut. Dimitri was right. They were building a weapon here. The tape ended after another few minutes, and the cave lapsed into silence. That explains why no one answered me on the radio, Dumont said. Electromagnetic interference, Hammond said. If your broadcast even got out, it would be garbled. And if they replied, we wouldn't have heard it. Maybe we can get a signal out if we go beyond the range of the EM field. Hammond started winding the tape back onto its reel. Sagara shook his head. No one's going out into the water. Not after they'd seen what happened to the fighter pilot. McBride sauntered over to the stack of remaining reels and began sifting through them. He went through the first stack and was halfway through the second when he grunted softly. He grabbed the tape and thrust it at Hammond. Let's hear this one next. Hammond read the date. October 1950, why that one? Just a hunch, McBride said. Sigara clenched his jaw, but when Hammond looked at him, he gave a little nod. Hammond put the tape on, turned the switch, and nothing happened. Not even when he nudged the tapes. He switched it off and on again with no result. He checked his rig. Weird. I've got power. What happened? St. Clair asked. 
him and shoulders hunched up under the gaze of everyone in the cave. Then he sagged in relief. Shit, I almost forgot. He grabbed the handle jutting out from the front of the box and cranked it clockwise. The motor is a wind-up. It probably just ran out of cranks. McBride chuckled. The key to our mystery. Nearly defeated by Hammond's forgetfulness. Oh, jeez. Hammond shook his head, though he smiled. Leave him alone, Dumont said. McBride bowed his head. My deepest apologies, Mrs. Hammond. St. Clair snorted. Dumont's cheeks turned the color of tomatoes. What's that about? Miller asked. Nothing, Hammond said a little too quickly. All right, here comes the next tape. He switched on the playback. This is Dr. Chloe Brown. It's October 4th, 1950. Also known as the worst day ever. They don't want us talking about it. But I need to talk to someone. This is the best I can do. Where do I even start? I guess with mail call. We don't get regular mail here. When it does arrive, it's usually weeks late. Most of us get magazines and newspapers, and we share them so that everyone has something to read. I needed a break from the endless meteorological experiments, so I went into the break room and found the Miami Herald. There was an article by Edward Van Winkle Jones about missing planes and ships in the Atlantic between Miami, Puerto Rico, and Bermuda. I didn't think much of it until I noticed the dates the aircraft went missing. They seemed familiar somehow. I told myself that I was being paranoid, but I checked them against our logs anyway. January 29th, 1948 and January 17th, 1949. Star Tiger and Star Ariel, McBride said. And another one between them. December 28th, 1948. That's the DC-3, Dumont said. McBride raised his eyebrows and touched a finger to his nose in agreement. A look of joy and wonder spread across his features. Give us the big one, he whispered almost to himself. But it was the fourth date I cross-checked that haunts me. I really didn't want to know the answer to this, but I had to look anyway. I still remember the fallout of it, and the endless searches, the national heartbreak. The whole country mourned that day. We did too once we heard about it. Because of the delay in getting information, no one put it together. No one realized that our first full-scale test of the hydrofan just happened to be on December 5th, 1945. Sigara exhaled slowly. He didn't need McBride to tell him what had happened on that day. Flight 19. An entire squadron of bright young men had disappeared without a trace into the ocean. Arguably the best known triangle disappearance. It fit together so perfectly, so jarringly, that even his naturally doubting mind couldn't deny the explanation. And the woman's recorded voice pressed on without relenting. He forced himself to pay attention to the words. Because I thought it was the right thing to do, I collected all the evidence. The Hydrofan runtimes, measured outputs, dates, and the Miami Herald article. I presented it all to the director this afternoon. He asked me a couple questions, but he mainly just took it in. The correlation was plain as day. Then he said he'd take care of it, and instructed me not to tell anyone. But nothing's happened, and I'm not sure anything ever will. The rest of the tape was unrecorded static. Hammond switched it off and sat there staring at it. Well, thank God, Dumont said at last. Hammond turned around to look at her. What? 
I always said there was a rational explanation for the triangle disappearances. You sound almost happy about it. I'm relieved, that's all. Think of how many pilots got the blame when their planes or ships went missing. Now we know the fault lies elsewhere. With the American government, St. Clair said. Hammond winced. I guess. But here's what I don't understand. They figured this out, what, 70 years ago? How is it that we never knew? The same way we don't know about Roswell or who killed Kennedy, McBride said. A good old-fashioned government cover-up. Marie St. Clair stomped away from the cave entrance. Maybe she should be more like DeMont and feel relieved that the triangle disappearances had an earthly explanation. Instead, she felt only fury that the Americans would develop and test a weapon so close to her home islands. Not that it surprised her. The colonial powers always treated the Caribbean as their personal rubbish heap when it served them. St. Clair! Cigar called out from behind her. She didn't stop. She wasn't feeling chatty. And he was the last person she felt like talking to. The Vice Admiral must have missed these cues because he jogged to catch up to her. Sinclair, can I ask you a favor? She shot him a glare. Haven't you already done enough? As soon as the lagoon empties, I'm going back into the city. Why? Hammond says there were more audio tapes than the ones he took. They could be important. And if Dimitri's men catch you in the city, then we can ask him to turn off the hydrofan. She shook her head. All you're going to do is get shot. That's why I'd like you to come along. Then maybe I won't. That would only waste time. She'd heard enough of the audio tapes to know where they were headed. I'd rather look for Malik. Sagara paused. I haven't seen him since he attacked the soldiers. I'm worried about him. I am too. But the tapes and the hydrofan are more important. She'd been around the Vice Admiral enough to recognize when he wasn't going to let something go. She sighed. When are you going? Right now. At least you didn't bring the weapon. Maybe I have it concealed. I'd know, she said. He offered a wry smile, conceding the point. It's still in the cave. Good. Maybe we won't lose that one, too. It came out a little more harshly than she meant, but she was tired. And now she had to hike down into the city when she should be looking for a boy who just lost his brother. They entered the lagoon following the same route as before, since the lab was one of the closest buildings. At least Sagara seemed to pick up on her mood and didn't make any attempts at conversation. They walked in silence, accompanied only by the crunch of their boots on the pale coral. His steps and hers produced a kind of comforting rhythm. Yet when they rounded the corner of the lab building, she could have sworn that a third sound intruded. She halted and held up her arm. The vice admiral stomped immediately. There was one soft rustle. It could have been an echo or even her imagination. Nothing else came, though. Sagara kept silent. A lesser man would have asked irritating questions. She gave him credit for that, grudgingly. Taunt, I heard something, she said. They skirted the building, working their way back toward the hatch. They turned the last corner, only to find their path blocked by four Soviets holding machine guns. Damn, Sigara muttered. He held up his hands to show he was unarmed. St. Clair did the same. She searched the soldiers' faces, but Vlad, the officer who'd been kind to her before, was not among them. Too bad. If he were, she might have been able to talk her way out of this. Instead, the sailors gestured for them to walk and escorted them to the submarine. One of them ran ahead. So it was that by the time they arrived, Dimitri stood beside the gangplank to his submarine, waiting. 
He locked eyes with her and smiled. I knew we would see each other again, St. Clair. I did not realize it would be so soon. I didn't want to come, she snapped. Where's Vlad? Being disciplined. Where is Miller? Back with our team, where she belongs, Sagara said. I hope she will still make a full recovery without the assistance of a trained doctor. Your concern is touching, St. Clair said. Why did you come into the city? He asked. He made it casual, but his eyes were hungry for the answer. St. Clair didn't oblige him. Sigara put his hands up again, this time in a placating gesture. You were right, Dimitri. Dimitri blinked and tore his eyes from St. Clair to look at the Vice Admiral. What did you say? You were right about this place. The Hydrofan was being developed as a weapon. Why would you tell me this? Dimitri asked warily. We just found out ourselves, Sigara said. And how did you manage that? We found some old recordings made by the researchers who worked here. You must think me a fool. My men have searched every square centimeter of this place. The Admiral frowned. By the set of his jaw, he was starting to lose patience. It doesn't matter how we know. What's important is that it is a weapon and it's dangerous to everyone. On the island and beyond it. Dimitri brushed an invisible bit of lint from his uniform and took a casual tone. Strange that America would build such a thing so far from its home shores. St. Clair snorted. Not really. You don't think so? Dimitri asked. Sagara tried to give her a signal to keep out of the conversation. She ignored him. Americans in the Caribbean are like five-year-olds playing with their siblings' toys. No care and even less respect. St. Clair, it's not like we... Sagara began, but she cut him off. I wouldn't even be here if I hadn't discovered your investigation and forced you to allow me to participate. Dimitri chuckled. Sagara put up his hands. I'm sorry. It's not an ideal situation, and you're right to point that out. She crossed her arms. Good. Sagara nodded at her and turned back to Dimitri. Dimitri, by powering the city with your reactor, you're creating a dangerous situation in this part of the ocean. You are blaming us for the danger? No, of course not. I'm sure you didn't know. The Americans were the ones who built it. You admit this? Yes, I admit it. But that was a long time ago, Sagara said. More than 70 years. The world was very different then. Seventy years? Dimitri gestured to the buildings. These are not seventy-year-old buildings. They are, and they aren't, Sigara said. Which is it? Both. Time is funny on the island. He was watching the other man as he said this. Something tells me you know this already. Dimitri glanced at his men, who still stood behind him. He issued a curt command in Russian. They saluted and went back the way they'd come. Once they were out of earshot, Dimitri looked at St. Clair, then Sagara. There is a strangeness. Your men say they've been here more than two years. He paused. Is that right? That is not your concern. How long, Dimitri? Dimitri's lips twisted. Twenty-nine months. And what year is it for you? Sagara asked. What kind of question is this? Just answer it. You answer it. Sagara took a breath. When we came here, it was 2019. Dimitri laughed and shook his head. You have been in the sun too long, Vice Admiral. He's telling the truth, St. Clair said. 
Dimitri swiveled his gaze to her. His smile faded. Two thousand and nineteen? She nodded. He looked down, uncertainty written on his face. What year do you think it is? Sigara prodded. 1984. Five years before the wall came down. The Berlin Wall? Dimitri looked almost haunted. I know it's a lot to take in, Sigara said in a sympathetic tone. But this is why we need you to shut down the Hydrofan. A shout came from behind them. The Soviet patrol had returned. Two of them were carrying someone, or trying to. For a terrible moment, Marie thought maybe they'd caught Malik, but no, there was a flash of blonde hair. Olivia. She wore the same ragged sundress and clung to her stuffed rabbit by one weather-stained ear. One of the soldiers ran over and spoke a flurry of Russian. Dmitri pointed at her and Sagara accusingly. What is this? You hope to distract me with these lies and use this girl as your spy. Don't be ridiculous, Sagara said. Then why is she sneaking around my city? She probably followed us, St. Clair said. We've been trying to look after her. She's alone. Dmitri beckoned and his men brought Olivia over. She stopped struggling when she saw him, but she clutched her rabbit tight against her chest. He crouched down so that his head was level with hers. What's your name, Vanyushka? Olivia? Ah, that is a beautiful name. My name is Dmitri. He lifted the rabbit's other stained ear. And who is this? He's Mr. Babbitt. The rabbit was threadbare and practically falling apart, but she held him up proudly. He laughed. Mr. Babbitt the Rabbit, of course. Of course he figures it out, Sigara muttered. Dimitri frowned at the animal. Is he missing an eye? We lost it, Livia said. I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me. Were you following these two? Dimitri pointed at St. Clair and the Vice Admiral. Mr. Babbitt wanted to see where they were going. Did they know you were following them? No. She leaned closer to him and whispered. I'm sneaky. What about the others from their camp? What about them? Do you remember how many friends they have? St. Clair cursed inwardly. Olivia had been around since the moment they'd crashed. She knew about the caves, about Dumont and Hammond, everything. Sagara stiffened, and she knew he'd had the same thought. I don't know. Olivia craned her head back to take in the massive hull of the K-221. Is this your boat? It is a submarine, and yes, Dimitri said. Would you like to see the inside? He did not just ask that. St. Clair looked at the Vice Admiral who cleared his throat. Is it dark? Olivia asked. Not too dark. We have lights, Dimitri said. I don't think you would like it, Olivia. St. Clair marched forward, ignoring the rifles of the Soviet sailors. In fact, I think it is time to head back to the beach. I agree, Sagara said. Which do you want, St. Clair? Dimitri asked. The fan or the little girl? She glared at him. You know which. She took Olivia's elbow and made to lead her away. Well, it was nice to meet you, Olivia. Dimitri held at his hand and she shook it. He held on to it for a moment longer than necessary. Then he let her go. St. Clair pulled her away before he could change his mind. The Soviet soldiers moved to block her path. Then Dmitri spoke a word, and they parted. Zagara put his hand on Olivia's shoulder and followed, beating the eyes of the sailors as he passed. St. Clair wanted to run, but forced herself to walk at a normal pace until they got around the nearest building. 
then she let out the breath she didn't realize she was holding. The moon people are nicer than I thought, Olivia said. No, they are not, St. Clair said. Yes, they are. She held out her hand to show them a black metal button about the size of a penny. Look what he gave me for Mr. Babbitt. Tessa DeMont loved ordinary things with lots of small details. Some people could not understand this. They wondered how she could actually enjoy reading in-depth technical reports. Hundreds of pages of error codes and warnings from a failing aircraft cockpit recorder? That was evening reading. Reams of communication logs from a busy airport tower she ate it up. She even gave each person a unique voice so that it sounded real in her head. Most people, when push came to shove, didn't want to do the work. It was so much easier to do a cursory job and blame the pilot any time an airplane crashed, or the mechanic, or the nearest warm scapegoats who couldn't defend themselves. She never accepted that as an answer. She certainly hadn't for the triangle disappearances. Sagara had wanted it to be terrorism. McBride wanted a conspiracy. All she'd wanted was a rational explanation. The hydrofan experiments, outlandish as they seemed, offered just that. A human-created cloud of electromagnetic interference that threw off navigation equipment, that disrupted communication, and that rapidly destroyed any crafts that strayed close enough to the source of the interference. Her group had been incredibly lucky to land the way they did, during low tide, or else they'd have shared the same fate as the fighter pilot. What do you think about the Fairchild flying boxcar? McBride asked, jarring her back to the present. Hammond had gone out to stretch his legs, so it fell to the two of them to chronicle the rest of the disappearances. That's the troop carrier, right? Left Homestead Air Force Base in Florida, heading for Grand Turk in June of 65. They found wreckage a month later in the Bahamas. I remember this one. All of that was in a straight line on the map, and the wreckage was positively identified. No distress signal, though, McBride said. Still, with wreckage found more or less on the route, that feels more like a sudden mechanical failure. All right. Another one for the not-the-hydrofan column. He marked it down in his ever-present notebook. You're enjoying this, aren't you? She asked. No more than you are, DeMont. I always find it satisfying to close out accident reports. We might break my own record today. Glad to hear it, McBride said, but without his usual gusto. Something wrong? She asked. Nothing I can really put into words, he said. Why don't you try? I'm disappointed about no aliens. She laughed. You would be. I'm serious. This and Roswell seemed the most likely proof of extraterrestrial intelligence, he said. I had good money riding on it. Something tells me you'll more than make up for it, she said dryly. The story of what they'd found had bestseller written all over it. See, that's the thing. I am a little worried I'll never get to tell it. Why not? He closed the notebook and leaned back against the cave wall. Well, let's play this out. Say we can persuade Dimitri to turn off the hydrofan and we get the radio back. Who will the first responders be? U.S. Coast Guard, almost certainly. Maybe Navy if there's someone close. Exactly. Military means government chain of command. So? They'll put a lid on this right away, before we can even say a word. They'll isolate us from one another, sequester us from the rest of the world, and make sure that the only story that comes out of this island is the one that matches their narrative. So you're a pessimist now? Only when it comes to the government. He glanced up at her. No offense. None taken. The NTSB is an independent government agency. Emphasis on independent. All that does is make it easier to disavow your actions. You sound as if you're really worried. 
I am really worried. All of us should be. We're sitting on a powder keg here, and we have little control over who figures that out. What if it's the wrong sort of people? Then we might as well go throw ourselves into the ocean. I would never do that. He barked a laugh. You might, if you knew the alternative. Hammond left the cave on cloud nine. He was exhausted, but exhilarated, after recording his last audio reel to digital for easier playback. Not that the B&H reporter wasn't quaint and traditional, but after the third or fourth manual rewinding of the tapes, he was glad to only have to do it once. Digital was far superior for his purposes anyway. DeMont and McBride remained in the cave, laboriously comparing what they'd learned about the hydrofan tests to known triangle disappearances. He'd enjoyed having the investigation musketeers back together, but after a few hours, he needed a break. So he'd taken a walk down to the beach, which was where he saw Sagara and St. Clair on their way back from the lagoon. Olivia walked between them, running out occasionally to swing on their hands. Hey, any luck? he called. Sagara frowned. St. Clair shook her head. Olivia let go of their hands and ran to him. Hi there. He smiled and offered her a high five, which she jumped up and gave him in midair. Where'd you come from? She followed us into the city, St. Clair said. Olivia. Hammond tried to make his voice stern, but he knew he was smiling. The vice admiral looked distracted. I've got to do something. Be back in a while. He stalked off, heading up the hill. That sounds ominous. Hammond looked at St. Clair. So what happened? We never even got to the lab. Dimitri's men were waiting for us. Damn. Hammond glanced at Olivia and caught himself. Dang, I mean. So, no tapes? No tapes. And no turning off the hydrofan. We tried telling him what year it was, but I'm not sure it all got through. He's still living in 1984. She gestured at Olivia. Keep an eye on her. It wasn't worded as a request. She turned and marched off in a different direction than Sagara had gone. Where are you going? Hammond called. To wash up. His eyes fell to Olivia. So you're following us around now? She shrugged ambiguously. Do you know how to sew? He laughed because the question caught him off guard. A little bit. It's been a while. Why? Olivia held out her rabbit in one hand and in the other a single black button. Mr. Babbitt wants to have two eyes again. Sagara surveyed the hut and the land around it. McBride hadn't been kidding about the low-wire entanglement. Intersecting rows of wire, sticks, and other debris made for a series of nested perimeters around the little building, ensuring that nothing could approach it quickly, or quietly, for that matter. He'd been required to do the same during boot camp on the shores of Lake Michigan. That seemed like forever ago. But the formula for low-wire entanglement hadn't changed in centuries. You learned it in basic training, and you never forgot. That told him he was on the right track. There was a line from the audio recordings that Hammond recovered that kept sticking in his head. Rust and dust. That was what brought him here. The old man with the rifle was one of the first castaways they'd encountered on Triangle Island, as he'd begun calling this place, and yet, ironically, remained the one they knew the least about. When he and McBride first found the hut, they'd barely had a moment before they had to flee the gunfire. Just outside the debris field, two palm trees had grown together, fusing their trunks into a wider vertical column that offered some protection, if it came to that. Sagara bent low to the ground, gritting his teeth against the ache in his knees as he scrabbled up against the tree trunk. The hut lay in wounded silence, but that was an illusion. 
If it looked occupied, that would only draw attention. Cigar leaned out around the tree trunk and raised a hand in what he hoped was a friendly gesture. Hello, in the hut. A shadow moved behind the circular window even before he'd finished talking. Metal glinted in the opening, followed by the unmistakable kshlack of a rifle's bolt slamming home. The only promising thing was that he didn't hear the safety click off. Then again, it might not have been on to begin with. I'm not armed, Cigar called. He held up both his hands so that the man could see. Go away, was the gruff reply. I just want to talk. He held his offering out in plain view. A plastic bottle just filled at the freshwater spring. I brought fresh water. A faint click of the safety was his only warning. There was a loud crack, and simultaneously, the water bottle exploded in his hand. He yanked it back against his chest, cursing and counted his fingers. Still five. Okay, forget the water. I think we got off on the wrong foot the other day. You were scared, I get that. But I think we have something in common. No answer came from the hut. That was good, maybe he was listening. I think I saw a tattoo, last time we were here. The image was fuzzy, but it was there, on the man's right arm. Anchor with a rope around it? He didn't hear a response. Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. He rolled up the sleeve of his left arm, held his breath, and held it out so the man could see. That was assuming he was looking, of course, and hopefully not aiming down the barrel of his rifle. I recognized it, because I've got one myself. A faint click announced the safety being put back on. Who are you? The man asked. His voice was hoarse, but strong. My name is David Sagara. He mustered his courage and swung around so the man could see him face to face. Until recently, I was the Deputy Commander of Fleet Forces and Vice Admiral for the United States Navy. Hammond found a needle and thread in the first aid kit at the beach camp. Not for the last time, he blessed St. Clair for grabbing that and the water in the scramble to get off the boat when they ran aground. He thought about going back to the cave, but Olivia was anxious to see the operation completed and she didn't seem to like the cave. So they sat down cross-legged on the beach, and she watched him work. Is this going to hurt? Olivia asked as he measured out enough thread to secure the button. The stuffed rabbit sat on his lap. He tried not to think about how filthy it was, or what had made the stains. It won't hurt, Mr. Babbitt. It better not. He chuckled at her assertiveness. All right, I'm ready for the button. She handed it to him. It was about the size of a quarter, smooth and metallic. Brass, probably. It had a nice heft to it. They didn't make buttons like it anymore. He ran the needle through the holes. There were only two which made his job easier, and tied off the thread. So, what were you doing following those two into the city? I don't know. She started building little sandcastles in the area between them marking each one with a piece of driftwood. Aren't you afraid of the moon people? Not anymore. He held the button up against the middle of the rabbit's empty eye socket. It would match pretty well, all things considered. He turned it around so she could see. Will this be all right? Oh, yes, she said. He got to work, weaving the thread in and out of the fabric and alternating between the holes. It had been a while since he'd sewn something, but it was kind of like riding a bike. You remembered the basics, and the rest came back with time. He hummed to himself as he worked. You're happy, Olivia said. I guess so. How come? He didn't really know how to explain it at first. I finally got back to work. You're happy because of work? Well, not just that. It made a difference this time. Helped people, you know? Helping people is good, she agreed. Where did you learn to sew? My fiancé taught me, so that I could fix holes in my socks. 
What's her name? Amanda. It still hurt him a little to say her name, but it was a light twinge now, not a deeper cut. Did she come with you to the island? He sighed. No, she died about a year ago. I'm sorry, Olivia said. He smiled at her, a little sadly. Thanks. My parents died too. I know, Olivia. And I'm so sorry for you. He couldn't imagine what it was like for her. To end up alone on this island, knowing that her parents were gone, it had to be terrifying. Is that why you were sad before? She asked. I guess you could say that. He paused. We used to spend every waking minute together. She was my entire life. That sounds like fun, Olivia said. It was. But once she was gone, I didn't know how to live by myself, and I wasn't sure I had a purpose anymore. What's a purpose? Something that you're meant to do. Does everyone have one? I'm starting to think so. Did you figure out what yours is? He smiled. I believe I did. My purpose was to come to this island. To help solve a puzzle that really needed solving. That's a good purpose, Olivia said. Thank you. I wonder what my purpose is. He feigned surprise. You mean you don't know? No. You're kidding. Am not. Well, I don't know if I should tell you this, he said, and he kind of meant it. To bring this up would be to mention the investigation and how much they'd known about Olivia's family before she disappeared. Then again, she was oddly mature for her age. Tell me, she insisted. One of the reasons we ended up here is that we were looking for you. She brightened. Really? Really. And you helped us so much when we got here, showing us the caves and the fresh water. You saved us. I think that was your purpose. You saved us so that we could solve the puzzle. She considered this for a moment. I like my purpose. I do too. He tied the thread in a triple knot and bit off the extra part with his teeth. Perfect. He turned the rabbit around so she could see. What do you think? She gasped. Mr. Babbitt, you're all better. She grabbed the animal and squeezed it. Then she surprised Hammond and hugged him too. The sound of running footsteps startled him. He stood pulling Olivia behind him. There. A man ran toward the beach. He thought about hiding, but then got a closer look and saw it was Sagara. Jesus, you scared, he began. The vice admiral peeled off his shirt and thrust it at Hammond. He didn't even slow, but ran down the beach to the water and splashed in. What are you doing? Hammond shouted. And why are you going into the water? A darker thought intruded. Olivia, when is the lagoon going to fill again? She was kneeling in the sand, building a sand fortification around Mr. Babbitt. Not long, maybe ten minutes? Shit. Cigara, the hydrofan! But the man didn't seem to hear him. Christ! He felt a rising panic. He pointed at Olivia. Stay away from the water! He dashed off, spraying sand in front of him as he ran inland to find help. Cigar ran until the water was up to his thighs, then dove into the next wave. The sea was as warm as bath water, salty but light and clear. He surfaced and came up into a forward crawl, pulling himself hard and fast through the water. He heard him and shouting from the beach but ignored it. He had only one objective now. The breeze came off the beach helping him along and keeping the worst of the spray out of his face when he stopped to get his bearings. He took a breath and plunged forward again, switching strokes to give his throbbing knees some relief. Mission failure. The 
two words played in his head as he swam, haunting him because they were still true. Everyone else on the team had done their part and then some. Dumont working out the coordinates. St. Clair ensuring their survival when they got to the island. Miller beating the medical odds and falling right back into her role of protector. McBride a walking triangle encyclopedia, no matter the annoying mouthpiece. And now Hammond. The kid who was in emotional pieces when Sagara found him, practically unable to work in his grief. He'd overcome that and cracked the most vital code yet. The audio reels that made the crucial link between the fan, the slipstream, and the greater effects in the Triangle region. Not only that, they suggested a cover-up at high levels of government. It had to be high level, because he'd not caught a whiff of it, even with better than top-secret security clearance. What a coup for a kid who'd gone into a tailspin a year ago. The least likely hero in their little team. Sagara himself was the one who let them all down. Lost track of Miller, lost his gun, made adversaries out of the Soviets, and stood by helplessly as they watched their best chance of escape turn into a fireball. Getting Miller back was his only real coup, though he couldn't take credit for that one on his own. And truth be told, he wasn't sure she was back. Bodily she was, but mentally she seemed conflicted. Also known as a commanding officer's nightmare. If they'd uncover the cause of the Bermuda Triangle, it would change the world. That was assuming they'd managed to tell anyone about it, which didn't seem likely at the moment. Yet it did nothing to resolve the disaster that precipitated the investigation in the first place. Not that he should have been surprised. The ocean was deep and dangerous. It gave up its secrets only grudgingly. The old man was the key, though. The missing link. Sagara considered this as he got farther from shore. The sound of the surf against the shore had faded, but now a new noise intruded. Waves slapping against the sharp edges of an obstruction. It loomed over him. It was the massive, pyramidal hulk that dominated the wrecks in the harbor. He swam around it until he reached a low point where he could grab on. The rusted steel was rough under his hands and cut into them. Hello, tetanus. He found a decent ledge and hauled himself out of the water. Then he climbed, scrambling for purchase in the pitted sea chute surface. The edge of the transom jutted out like a balcony overhead. He nearly fell back onto the wreck, trying to get a handhold. At last, he heaved himself up onto the flat surface and collapsed, panting. He was out of shape. He should have been swimming twice a day to keep up his stamina, but he'd been worried about the dangers of the hydrofan. Damn, the hydrofan. It was due to start up again soon. He'd better make this fast. He rolled to his hands and knees and crawled to the edge of the transom. A long, narrow piece of metal jutted at an angle near him. A section of old railing, perhaps, but it suited his purposes. He broke it off, ending up with a strip about as long as his arm. Then he went to the corner, moved two feet down, four feet over. He started scraping it. The rust was dry and brittle, thanks to hours of unrelenting tropical sun. It sloughed off easily, revealing the lighter steel beneath. Gunmetal gray. And there, right where he expected it, was the letter L. Oh my god, he whispered. He kept scraping, and the symbols appeared. He pictured them in his head, and each one rose up from beneath the rust to match the vision. An H, a D, then a hyphen, and the number one. LHD-1. A vessel number belonging to the U.S. Navy assigned to a singular vessel. The USS Wasp. Son of a bitch! He pounded the wreck with his fist, half in anger and half in disbelief. It was here the whole time. You're listening to The Triangle, 
Narrated by Neil Helligers. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm. Listen away. The Triangle is written by Dan Cobalt, Mary McGuinness, and Sylvia Spruck Wrigley. Executive produced by Molly Barton and Julian Yap. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith.